What's up, everyone? This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I interview a good friend of mine and former chiropractor of mine, Lindsay Matthews. Lindsay owns a company called BirthFit. Uh, in this show, we talk about how to mentally and physically prepare for pregnancy as well as recover from pregnancy um, and how to do so as efficiently and healthily as possible. The reason I wanted to do this show is because I think that there's so much there's so m- much information out there on this topic, but there, there seems to be so many different messages, kind of like there is in the nutrition world. There's so many different uh, you know, opinions and messages about how to how to think about all of this stuff. And Lindsay is someone that I really respect respect as a chiropractor and uh, movement specialist. And so I really wanted to hear her perspective and and you know give you guys a lot of good information on this topic. Uh, before we get started, if you're a regular listener of this show and you haven't done so yet please put this show on pause and head to iTunes, leave me a review. I would really appreciate that. I'm doing a little experiment here. I'm going to invite any of you that are interested to call into a voicemail that I have set up and leave some questions. So then I'm going to play back your question on the podcast and I'm either going to answer the question myself or I'm going to get one of my guests to help me answer those questions. If you're interested, the number is 801-449-0503. That's 801-449-0503. Enjoy the show. What's up, everyone? This is Mike Cashew. You're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. I'm here with doctor of chiropractic, Lindsay Matthews, owner of BirthFit, coach at Douche Gym, all around badass. Lindsay, I know you're super busy. <laughs> Thank you so much for making some time to do this with me. For sure. I'm excited to be here. So j- just a little background for everyone before we get started. I met Lindsay in 2012, I think it was, as we were preparing for the games. Tommy Hackenbrook flew her out. Um, we had you know, we had a six six individuals training super hard. Uh, I had my, my back issues. Taylor had some back issues. Ta- uh, so Lindsay came in and she just did a bunch of work on us and gave us some, um, I don't know, I guess you would call it kind of structural balance work and, yep. um, maybe just pillar work. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So that was, that was, uh, h- how do I say it? Like you, you were obviously very good at working with your hands and I could tell you really knew what you were talking about right off the bat. And within, you know, a couple, a couple sessions, I already started to learn quite a bit from you. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, that was, that's back in the day, which is crazy. Um, cause that was during my time of working on set or with professional athletes a lot. Um, but I really liked working with like athletes like you, like CrossFitters or at that time, like Olympic athletes as well, because y'all are very in tune with your body. Like, you know how something feels or, you know, when something's off and, um, especially you, like you, you stuck out, like you chose to start to establish a relationship with your body, which has been, um, really awesome uh, to watch you kind of evolve over the years. It's I, I've enjoyed it. Well, thank you. And that's something that I definitely, <laughs> I, I've come to know about myself. I, I, I can't buy into something at all if I don't understand why I'm doing it. You right. Know what I mean? So I think it's been interesting for me to figure out which people are like that and which people just kind of want to be told what to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some people- some people just want, okay, t- give me a prescription of movements to do and I'll do them. It's like, well, you, there's a why behind everything or there's got to be an intention or you're just, there's, it's just practice. It's not deliberate, you know? Exactly. So <laughs> y- you've worked with some super, super high level athletes as well as, uh, you know, average Joes and thousands of pregnant women. And today <laughs> I just want to talk about mostly, uh, you know, preparing for and recovering from pregnancy. So <laughs> your company birth fit. Yeah. I'm sure that when a lot of people see that name, they think that you just get people back into shape after pregnancy, right? You get them fit again. So yeah. before we get started, what is, what is kind of from a high level, what does birth fit encompass and why is your work so important? 
Oh, for sure. Um, so birth fit, the literal, the literal definition that we've come up with is birth fit means a state of readiness uh, specific to childbirth that is achieved through um, evolved practices and fitness, nutrition, nutrition, chiropractic, and mindset. And we've chosen these four pillars, fitness, nutrition, chiropractic, and mindset, based on um, our experiences as doulas, as chiropractors, as mothers, as childbirth educators. Um, you know, there's a huge team of us, but, um, you know, back whenever I started this blog, um, BirthFit, years ago, I probably started it in 2011. Uh, and it just started basically from my opinion and I had, um, an actress come to me and she had this timeline, you know, as they have deadlines and they have to look a certain way. And, um, you know, she wanted to be in the best, best shape, like the most optimal version of herself in order to get pregnant, stay pregnant, give birth and, um, like give birth the most efficient way possible. I guess that was her, um, goal. And then recover smart and like first push. You're talking about like one push and she's done. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of unrealistic, but right. uh, <laughs> yeah, she wanted to go as um, smoothly as it possibly could. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, me at that time, back in 2011, I was like, oh, well, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. And um, you know, I can totally. And my wheels were already turning because. Um, I worked a lot like my my big thing at that time was working with um, professional athletes or stunt people or like yourself, I call it, you know, professional performers. And our goal is to prepare for this event and then recover and recover smart so that, OK, if we have to jump off of a building again the next day, that we're in the best shape possible to do that. Or if we have to play two soccer games back to back that we prepare as well as we can, we recover as well as we can, and we perform as well as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I was, you know, my wheels were already turning in that sense because I hadn't been anywhere around the birth world or knew anything about it. Um, you just, I, I was, you know, the typical um, American female where I was just exposed to, oh, birth hurts, birth is painful, um, it's traumatic, it's this, it's that. And, you know, me being the rebel that I am deep down inside, I was like, there's got to be a different way. Like, it's got to be, I don't, I'm not going to buy into this, especially if I want kids. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to go search out what they do in Africa or what they do elsewhere, you know? Um, and they prepare, they regard, um, pregnant women as sacred beings. They, um, that, you know, they recover smart. They take care, like the village takes care of these women. And so that's kind of how I started thinking about the birth process here in, um, the U S and it, I wanted, I was like, there's gotta be a huge shift. Like we can't, we can't go on living like this. Um, you know, especially as we bring human beings into this world, like that's, that's far out. Um, so I did all I could at that time to, um, educate myself. I did doula training, started attending births, um, did hypnobirthing training, childbirth educator training. And I just like, just drank all the birth education I could and um you know I started treating it like it was a huge athletic event because it 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 is and it involves um you know a preparation of mind body and soul that you know some women are so ready to take on and some women are like I don't know if it's for me you know um but um it's a beautiful journey especially when one approaches it with an open heart and an open mind Absolutely. It's, it's got to be one of the most amazing human processes in the world. For sure. So for sure. <laughs> you, you were working with these top level athletes and all of the, all of those types of people. Why, like per, from a personal standpoint, why did you shift and start to focus more on, on, you know, this kind of work rather than the, the yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. Um, and you know, part of it was, um, you know, I loved the thrill of getting like some of the best soccer players in the world ready for their game or the best actors getting ready to jump off a building. But, you know, at the end of the day, I just wasn't fulfilled. And, um, 
I read this book by uh, this Dr. Michelle Odent, who's a um, French ob and this was probably like in 2010, 2009, and the book's called Childbirth and the Future of Homo Sapiens, and I'm kind of a science dork, like I come from a science background, um, and that book really just struck me, and that's when I was first exposed to it, and then this woman came into my office that wanted to approach birth in this ma- manner, and things just started lining up, and, um, you know, I, 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 I believed like from a very young age that I was put on this earth to like serve people. And I believe that the universe totally has a path for you. And, um, you know, the more I make decisions that are in line with that path or that the, the path that the universe has for you, that it just kind of flows as it should. And, you know, as I started making decisions, um, and writing this blog and just reading and, you know, things started to fall into place. And, you know, I, I was traveling the world working on this movie. Um, you might have heard of it, Mission Impossible. And um, I came back and uh, I was like, I love I like this, but I don't love it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, I just. I wasn't even planning on quitting my job. I was just like, can I explore more options, you know? Um, And it was funny. I just walked into our, like, meeting, our team meeting. And, you know, it's like, I was like, guys, I appreciate all that we've been through together. But um, I can't do this anymore. I need to go find out what's what's out there for me. So without... um, (laughs) <laughs> without any financial stability or anything, I was like, let's freaking figure out how to do this and take the huge leap of faith. And so far, like the universe has totally had my back. And, you know, I, I believe this is what I'm put on this earth to do. I love that. I love <laughs> that so much. And I can relate to that so much. Uh, you know, right around a little bit after I met you, you know, I, I went to work for LSU. And yeah. I grew up like I was a super fan. I, you know, I'm like two, three years old wearing LSU gear and oh, yeah. I grew up idolizing the players and the coaches. And then all of a sudden I got this chant, a chance to, to work with those athletes, right? Like yeah, literally some of the best athletes in the world. So as a strength and conditioning coach, that's close to like the epitome. And oh, sure. just like you, it was very exciting and it was thrilling to work with people that you see, you know, I, I worked with people that are some of the biggest stars in the NFL today and super exciting <laughs> work. But at the end of the day, I felt like there was this peace, you know, deep in my soul that wasn't getting fulfilled. For and sure. So just like you, like without, without any kind of safety net whatsoever, I jumped ship from that and... <laughs> You know, it's all worked out, you know, if, if yeah. I hadn't and I had, I had tried to play it safe, I'm not sure, you know, I would have created the opportunities that I've created in my life today. I don't think I would have been in the same mindset if I wouldn't have, right. um, you know, just jumped ship like I had. Yeah, you got to trust your gut mm-hmm. for sure. I love that. So cool. I want to, I want to get, start to dive into, you know, kind of the, the technical part of, or the, you know, yeah, the technical piece of what you do at BirthFit, but before mm-hmm. we really go into it, can you give kind of a high level perspective of kind of what the, what the most important changes women should be aware of when, when thinking about uh, pregnancy from a physical and, and movement standpoint? Yeah. So you know, um, as humans, the, the healthiest version of ourselves, like, especially as women is when we produce a, when we have a regular cycle, when we're ovulating and, you know, when a human being is pregnant as when a woman's pregnant, that's the healthiest, most beautiful, I think, version of herself. And, um, you know, in a kind of sciencey standpoint, we are designed to reproduce. And, um, you know, that's why I view pregnant women as the most healthiest, beautiful versions of a human being possible. Um, so the moment from conception on, um, our bodies are changing and making adaptations for this little fetus. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, 
early before we can even see anything. Um, there's like, uh, I think there's a study done in like the seventies or eighties with ultrasound that starts to detect fetal movement as early as like five weeks pregnant. Um, and the first thing to develop within the fetus is the nervous system and it starts to develop movement. It starts to develop a flow and this kind of flow is maintained throughout our lives through the, um, spinal cord. But, um, you know, there's a movie out and I, I think it's on Amazon or Netflix now, but it's called in utero. And, um, what we do as women and the environment that we keep around us heavily, heavily influences, um, this little fetus, this little baby. And, you know, the movement we do, the energy we have around us, the words we say, the foods we eat, um, the mindset we have, all of that influences that little special spirit that's growing inside of us. And, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, this research wasn't available. But now, and even in the future, all of this research is going to be coming out more and more. And, um, you know, I totally believe in conscious conception and, you know, sitting down, eating a meal with you and your baby that's inside of you and teaching and creating that relationship and carrying that on out through labor and delivery. And then once baby's outside of you during the fourth trimester. Um, and I say this because mom and baby are the only ones guaranteed tickets to the birth. Yes, you will have your healthcare provider and you will have dad or partner there, but they may not make it there. Um, I've been a few or missed a few births where mom and baby, that was it, you know? Um, so maintain or creating a relationship, maintaining that relationship throughout pregnancy involves some intentional, deliberate practice through mind, body, soul, and carried out through the whole pregnancy. And that's going to prepare you leaps and bounds for labor and delivery. And then it's going to set you up to, um, you know, have a smoother transition into motherhood, especially if it's your first baby or your third, fourth, or fifth baby. Um, you know, each pregnancy and birth need to be treated as as it's one because that's the only birth for that little fetus, for that baby. You know, it may be mom's fourth birth, but each pregnancy is so different. So approaching it with a roadmap is kind of how we talk about it. And, um, you know, we just get super intentional and we try to employ all four pillars, um, with each woman into some, in some, um, degree. And, um, you know, we just create daily practices and go from there. So let's, let's go into preparation first. What are some of these intentional things that, and, and I know that part of your program is that, you know, each woman is an individual and they all have right. unique needs, right? Um, right? But since we're doing this on a, we're recording it beforehand and we're, we don't have a Q and a, like what are some of the things <laughs> that are like the most common things or even maybe things that all women need to take into account when thinking about preparing for pregnancy or not preparing for pregnancy, but preparing for birth? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'll kind of touch on like, let's say if a woman finds out she's pregnant, um, one of the most common things uh, women will do is schedule a, a birth fit basics consultation. And that's basically they come to me either via phone or in person, and they can do birth fit basics consultations with any of the regional directors. Um, they're all trained in this. But basically, we get a, like figure out where this woman is. Like, how much is she training? What does her nutrition look like? What kind of mindset does she have? Like, does she have a fixed mindset versus growth mindset? Um, and then we get into chiropractic. Like, how does she take care of her body? How does she recover? Does she have any um, regular recovery practices? And from there, you know, this could be the only time they interact with us, or it may be just the start. But from there, we basically give them, you know, a, um, a outline with a few suggestions, and um, and then we go from there. Let's say um, if mom's in my practice and um, she just found out she was pregnant, then I would also evaluate her body, like figure out kind of what 
we did back in the day, but more specific towards um, pregnancy. So I might figure out, okay, what does mom do daily? Like, does she sit all day? Does she, is she on her feet all day? Does she drive all day? Um, all of these positions or lack thereof positions, or let's say if mom's only a runner or only does cycling or, you know, things like that, then, um, or if she sits all the time, that, um, is going to create very short hip flexors. It's going to put psoas, you know, super tension and maybe even hold a lot of emotions in there. And, um, that's going to create a big, um, like asymmetry in the pelvis and, that's huge for later on as baby and mom start to get in position for labor and delivery. So I like to evaluate what's going on in the body. Um, one of the first, like if we want to talk about each of the four pillars, um, one of the first things we take out when somebody's pregnant is extreme flexion type of movements, um, like movement in the sagittal plane. So if we're talking about, you know, fitness stuff, that sit-ups, crunches, toes to bar, um, GHD sit-ups, um, uh, what else we got? Mountain climbers. Um, and that's mainly to keep mom, um, w- her pelvis and her rib cage in alignment with each other. Um, because if pelvis and rib cage are stacked nicely on top of each other, then you can get those deep diaphragm breaths and baby has more room to just like do baby's thing, move around, embrace movement and, um, hopefully go head down whenever the time comes. But, um, so real yeah. quick, so what, yeah. say, and I think this is a, correct me if I'm wrong. I think this is a very common mistake that people make, right? They, they continue to do a lot of these, uh, flexion movements and mm-hmm. it, it and and I think this is what's happening, right? You're as you're tightening the anterior uh, abdominal muscles, you you are basically like creating this this perma crunch position, right? Which sure. presses your rib cage and you know makes it so that For you sure. can't get the your normal breath. For sure, and like the breath is um, the biggest thing, but more like more and more women are concerned with. Um, diastasis rectus abdominis which is the separation of the abs Mm -hmm. and you know they're more concerned with that postpartum but they don't realize that oh the stuff I could be doing during pregnancy can help heal that help my abs come back together you know um help the core as a entirety function on the long end um and not only does that extreme crunch type of motion um you know put every like ruin your breath. Um, but it also exposes, um, you know, on the backside disc issues. And, um, you know, if you're not balancing that out with, you know, posterior chain exercises or extension type of movements, then you're not doing yourself any good there. So you mentioned something briefly, you, you talked about a growth versus a fixed mindset. And that's something that I talk (laughs) about on here all the time for those that have not heard the explanation yet can you explain what the two types of mindsets are and how they apply to pregnancy oh for sure so have you talked about the book mindset by carol dweck like that but oh good this is their first time (laughs) listening so everybody Uh, needs to listen to that so if you haven't read that book i strongly encourage you to read that book but um basically a growth mindset is, you know, you approach anything with a blank canvas, like the possibilities are endless. Just because you failed a math test does not mean you're bad at math. Um, With a fixed mindset, you might fail a math test, assume that you're bad at math, never sign up for an honors math class again, and just continue to suck at math um, for the rest of your life. That's like super basic definition. But um, The way we apply this to pregnancy is and birth and postpartum and everything is, um, you know, just be, and we hear, this is a perfect example. Um, we hear the comment all the time. Well, my mom had a C-section, so I'll probably have a C-section. Well, C-sections don't, they're not genetic. They don't run in the genes, you know? Um, and a lot of times that, um, 
predicted or had to do with the environment and the birth team. Um, so that's a perfect example of, you know, get that out of your head. This experience can be whatever you make of it. Like you have this blank canvas here. You can design your pregnancy. You can, you know, start to design your birth team, start to choose where you want to give birth. You can start to choose your healthcare provider and you can design anything you want in that experience based on what desires you want there or want to have around you. Um, and then as far as like the postpartum period goes, like I love the postpartum period. I love working with moms because this to me is just a beautiful canvas of opportunity and it's a time to reset, recalibrate and work on breath, work on efficient movement. You can even heal um, maybe hip injuries, lower back injuries that you've had prior. And, um, you know, our little saying is like slow is fast during this time period. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a time to get intentional and efficient with your movement. And through the growth mindset, really anything is possible. But if you approach things with that fixed mindset, then you may not ever lose that 15 pounds or your core may never come back or you might have a C-section, you know, like if you say it, then it's probably going to happen. Right. And it's not because, you know, some kind of magic is happening or you're putting out like energy waves into the environment, although you may be, but right. if you have that type of mindset, then you're not going to take the actions. You're not going to, you know, totally. risk failure or risk uh, you know, you're not going to be vulnerable because you already mm -hmm. think you have it figured out. You already think you're going it's to have a section or you're not going yeah. to be able to lose the weight or whatever. So you end up not going to the gym as consistently or not being right. as consistent with your, your recovery methods, whatever that may be. Totally. And that's a good point. You're not going to employ the actionable steps in the direction of maybe your desires. You're already on the path of fixation. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the most common misconceptions people have, uh, in terms of preparing for birth? <laughs> um, I would say one of the biggest misconceptions or, and it's a, it's a sad misconception is that, um, your healthcare provider has your best interest at heart and you know, they, they may, I, I don't know, but um, the numbers say otherwise, and my experience has said otherwise, and, um, you know, especially for women birthing in a hospital, um, and maybe you're with your ob that you've had since you were young, et cetera, et cetera, but you're, you have got to look out for you. Nobody else is, no matter how close you feel to that doctor. Um they're, that doctor is under the rules of the hospital. They're under the rules of their malpractice insurance. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if they perform a cesarean, they're not going to be faulted for that. Um, and that's, that's why cesarean births are so common. You know, um, inductions are so common. Um, they, you have to arm yourself with education and empowerment. And so it may be a doula or it may be a birth center instead of a hospital. But, um, yeah, I would say the biggest misconception is that your healthcare provider has your best interest at heart. And, and it sounds like maybe a misconception is also that your healthcare provider knows what's best. Right. Totally. And, you know, I think there's a really good book called, um, lying in the childbirth history in America. And it talks about basically how childbirth, the industry of childbirth has evolved from like the time we, 1776 until now. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very, it became very assembly line. It became run by insurance companies and, um, each hospital is a little different. Each city is a little different, but in the grand scheme of things, um, I think uh, women taking back birth or taking back the voice and, you know, exercising that choice. I think um, we're going to eventually change the birth world in America. I, 
I, I love that perspective <laughs> so much. I, I, like so many questions just popped into my mind, but why do you think, why do you think it's so hard for some, and I have an idea, but I want to hear your perspective first. Why do you think it's so hard for some people to do that, to take the, take full responsibility and start to do their own research and stuff like that? Mm. <laughs> well, I, I think it's um, just like with anything, like um, with nutrition or fitness or, you know, um, just a daily practice is hard. And that's what's needed um, during pregnancy. And, you know, taking full responsibility of your actions also requires you to be vulnerable, to be courageous. And for some people, they've never really had adversity in their life. And so they don't know what it feels like. They don't know what that step feels like in that direction. And maybe they've never had the support to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's also hard. like there's just so much information out there. A lot of people just have no idea who to trust. So they might have, the, totally. you know, the work ethic and the um, they might be open to trying doing the right thing. But I think a lot of people have have a lot of trouble probably finding what the right thing is out there because there's so many different messages in in opposite directions, I would imagine. Yeah, and it's hard to filter through all that information, especially when deep down you may not know yourself or what you value or what makes your body tick, you know? Um, I love yeah. that. And obviously, I want people to go and look at birthfit.com and stuff like that, but what what are some <laughs> what are some ways people can think about shift uh, sifting through all of that information? Are there any like certifications they can look for in different providers or or things like that or I any of that sort? Yeah, um, you know, actually, we so <laughs> we have a BirthFit podcast, and on there, I try to present um, you know information from all sides, like mm -hmm. hospital, home birth midwife, doctor, um, yoga, fitness, that sort of thing. Um, but in our birth fit prenatal series, which is, you know, an education series for childbirth, um, there, we do a few exercises, but one of the exercises we do is this circle exercise. And, you know, there's kind of very similar variations to this exercise out there in the world, but, um, basically there's a circle and you put your name in the middle of it. And you start writing all in this circle, you know, what makes you you and what things do you love? What music do you love? What foods do you love? Um, what smells like really just take your breath away. And then outside the circle, you start writing things that you know you don't like or you know you don't want at birth. Um, and it you start to create this, um, this little this diagram or this um, image and you see there's such a distinction between what you know is you and what is definitely not you or what you don't want at your birth. And, um, I think something as simple as that, you know, especially once you find out you're pregnant or you're thinking about this, um, you have to know yourself better than anybody out there. Mm -hmm. Um, that I, I feel like that's what pregnancy demands of women. And, um, some, at some point throughout the pregnancy, birth or postpartum period, you, a woman will be challenged and, you know, she'll have to make some tough decisions. She'll have to, you know, employ some help if she wants some help, but, um, there'll be some challenges that she'll face. And, um, you know, she's really got to know herself deep down inside. And so that's one of the reasons we do that little simple circle exercise. But, um, you know, once, once you know yourself, you can read things, you know, for, as you know, like Ina May's Guide to Childbirth or, you know, Well-Adjusted Babies or then go as far as, you know, um, oh, what are some other like uh, or watch the business of being born. Like you can watch those things and just take in the information that you need for yourself and let the other information that you don't need just go and not fill up that space inside you, you know? Without this new this new one just becoming your Bible. 
Right, 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 right. I love that. I love that exercise. And I love what you said about um, basically self-awareness. I think that's like a universal truth. The totally. being a, becoming more aware of ourselves is kind of the, the fastest way to progress and success in anything, it seems like. Totally. So, totally. Uh, okay, I'm sure you get this question all the time. <laughs> uh, snatching and doing clean and jerks and stuff like that. Are those safe? during pregnancy if so like uh, are there any limitations and also are there any other movements that people should kind of stray away from <laughs> so yes and no but um here's the deal with that is when the belly starts to show or the baby bump starts to show and it starts to alter the bar path that's when the barbell the olympic lifts have to go um because our bodies are not going to let anything happen to that baby. So, of course, you're going to swing the barbell out and around your belly. And those movement patterns are going to be stored in your primitive brain. And let's say you stop opening your hips because you want to swing that barbell around or you don't want to extend all the way because that sticks belly out. That's you know, that's going to create faulty movement patterns. That's going to be stored in your primitive brain. And then on the postpartum side of things, that's going to take three times as long to fix that movement pattern. Um, so I would say anywhere, it, and it varies for um, women, weeks 20 to 30 are usually when this starts to happen. And usually what we do at first is switch to, um, you know, dumbbells or kettlebells. Right. And you know, you can still grit, get a great training session through using dumbbells or kettlebells, doing um, uh, clean and presses, one arm snatches, anything um, using those implements. Um, but then we also switch to more of a powerlifting approach. And um, we like to say we only take lifts that we know we will make. So whether we're squatting, pressing, benching, or deadlifting, um, we're only going to take three or four lifts at above 80%, but each of those lifts we know we will make. And if we don't know we're going to make them, then we're going to call it and we're going to accept the one we made and we're going to walk away empowered that day. Um, as far as, um, like Olympic lifting, there's, we can still practice drills, like maybe a snatch grip deadlift, or you can go from, you can practice, uh, you know, the snatch balances behind the neck, any kind of accessory type of Olympic lifting drill or exercise usually is still employable at this time. And, um, you know, a thousand reps can be done with an empty barbell or a super light weight. And that's just going to ingrain that, that proper movement pattern in your body. Mm -hmm. I, I really love the perspective of, uh, you know, not messing up that movement pattern, right? You could definitely get yeah. away with snatching, I'm sure, for a, totally. a, a few more months and get the weight overhead, but totally. is it really worth it? Right? Yeah, and that's what we ask our athletes, you know, our mom athletes is like, what? why? Why are you doing this? Um, is it to prove to somebody? You know, I have no doubt you're fully capable of snatching that barbell overhead and sticking it, but it's going to look ugly and you know, it's just not worth it. Right. And you can absolutely get stronger only doing pulls for, for the for vast sure. majority of people. I remember uh, years ago, I had a wrist in injury for like three months and all I did was heavy pulls. And I, as soon as I could snatch again, I hit a 10 pound PR and I hadn't snatched in <laughs> months. You know what I mean? I love it. Yeah. Um, so great. And, and a lot of that stuff, pulls are, are probably some of the best things I would, I would assume to kind of counteract what's, what's going on in the body and prepare the body, right? Oh, totally. Strengthen the posterior totally. chain, uh, strengthen the glutes, all of that kind of stuff. Totally. So you mentioned earlier those, um, abdominal flexion exercises and, mm -hmm. and, and being really careful about doing them and probably not doing them for most of pregnancy and, and, uh, after pregnancy, or is there anything else that women should not be doing uh, <laughs> in this whole period? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, so we go over this like, uh, weeks by weeks during our birth fit coach seminar, but, um, you know, people always ask, what can I do instead of abs? Well, <laughs> 
if you're squatting, you're doing core stuff, you know, um, if you're deadlifting, you're doing core stuff. But, um, we've created this thing, this movement series called the functional progression, which all these videos are on YouTube, but, um, you know, the functional progression to us is like your daily vegetables or your supplements. Like we start every training session with movement and breath work and the functional progression. And we do this throughout pregnancy and for at least the first six to nine months postpartum. Uh, we like to say yours, your postpartum as long as you were pregnant at the very minimum. Um, oh, interesting. Ah, <laughs> um, so incorporating those movements are so key and they're also a way to help you tune into your body and um, figure out what's going on. And every day is going to be different. One day the left side may be cranky, the other day the right shoulder may be cranky. But you know, the more you spend time with your body, the more you spend time moving and getting to know your body, the better you're going to know your body for when labor and delivery comes and then on the postpartum side of things. Um, you know, uh, we don't ever really go for like one rep maxes, but we're not afraid to lift heavy. But like I said earlier, um, we only take lifts we, we know we will make. Right. And, um, you know, that's because this is a time of empowerment. This is not a time of training that comes later after pregnancy, you know, um, and this is true of, you know, if I have a professional athlete or a professional runner, mm-hmm. um, those things. And, oh, That's we exactly uh, what I was going to say. I, I treat athlete, any other athlete than like a power lifter or weightlifter and sometimes CrossFitters should, should probably take that same type approach, right? They, they're totally. not, their sport is not to max out. So if they're ever missing yeah. a lift in the gym, then like, what's the, what's the, really the point, right? Other yeah, than so ego true. and pride. Totally, totally. Um, yeah, and like on our deadlifts, we never drop it from the top. You can do that another time in another place, but not now. Um, and then, you know, on the postpartum side of things, um, the oh, I forgot to mention running. Running's a big one because um, people always think, oh, I can continue running, but, you know, towards 30 weeks, maybe even 25 to 30 weeks, it's very common for women to stop running. Um, and we, we, if you want to keep running great, but make sure you have form and make sure you're, uh, strength training twice a week, um, on the postpartum side of things, same thing. Like don't start with running. Don't start with lifting. Mm -hmm. Um, we start with breath work. We start with functional progression. Then we start with strict movements and we start with the basic powerlifting movements, but you know, it's super light weights and making sure we're creating that intra abdominal pressure throughout all the movements. Um, and we don't really, um, yeah, we don't do any weight belts, weight shoes, anything like that during the first six to nine months or even year postpartum. Do you have any advice for women on nutrition, like in terms of my, like including certain micronutrients or supplements during pregnancy? Obviously, <laughs> uh, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna promote like a, a healthy diet overall. And that's by far the most important thing to get a variety of, of different foods and yeah. stuff like that. But are there any specific things that people should make damn sure they're including? <laughs> yes. Um, eat real food like meats, fishes, vegetables, fruits. Um, you know, I can't really stand behind a vegan diet during pregnancy or postpartum. Um, they, Real food's huge, and you're going to want to eat multiple times throughout the day. Um, hydration is another big one. Pregnant athletes need to hydrate twice as much as sedentary people. Um, and, you know, if you're, I think on our blog history, there's, you know, what to look for in a prenatal vitamin. But one of the biggest things is um, methylfolate. And that's just a really nice um uh, version of folate because a lot of the times you'll get um, folic acid, which uh, is kind of the synthetic man made version of that uh, nutrient. And that's, I mean, it's just going to pile up in your body. It's not going to do anything. Um, but fish oils, that's always good because that's going to decrease inflammation throughout the body. Um, and inflammation is also, you know, it's in your tissues and it 
nobody wants inflammation going into labor and delivery because labor and delivery is already in an inflammatory state. And if you have vaginal tissue that's inflamed, then that's going to be hard to, you know, have your cervix open even more. Um, fish oil, uh, you know, prenatals, vitamin D, um, those are all good ones. But, um, you know, if there's any question before actually adding a supplement into your diet, I would get your blood work done. Like I get my blood work done every six months and just to check it out. Um, you know, if I were a crazy woman and looking on, you know, Facebook groups or, you know, based on other people's advice, then I would be downing vitamin D supplementation where I get, I, like, there, I don't need that. Like I have almost like twice as much as the normal human, which is crazy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would get your blood work done and, um, you know, get somebody that knows what they're doing to help you out with that supplementation. Cause this is not a time to mess around with that. It's funny. You should say that. I think, uh, like how many, how many fewer people would be on a gluten-free diet if they got their blood work done first? Right. <laughs> Yeah, I saw I saw a really funny meme uh, about like something about. No, I'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, <laughs> in California. Um, anyway, oh, what, sure. <laughs> what, when or how do people? How do women know when they should stop exercising before birth? Well, that's funny you say that because. Um, you know, there, there's a great book out there called Exercising Through Your Pregnancy, and it was written by an MD, Dr. James Clapp. And I came across this, you know, shortly thereafter that other book that changed my life. Um, and in there, it states that, you know, women that stop exercising, you know, a month or two before birth will actually have larger babies. And, um, you know, the women that exercise have there's research in there that shows they have perfectly fine, healthy babies, you know, within the normal weight gain lengthwise um, uh, um, measurements. But, um, you know, you, d you don't want to stop exercising before birth, but you want to change it. You got, you got to get intentional with this stuff. And so what we do is around weeks 32 to maybe 35 is we scale down the intensity um, and we scale it down a lot. And, um, you know, this, we may remove, you know, high intensity interval training, um, or longer Metcons, but, um, you know, the days we'll, we still want mom to come and have that intentional training practice at the gym or at her house or wherever we're training her at. And, you know, some of these days, um, at least two of the days a week will still be strict, um, strength training. And, um, you know, in those days, we'll definitely work the squat, we'll definitely work the deadlift, because all that's needed to uphold, like, hold this structure or this frame that mom's carrying around. Um, so it's just definitely scale, like a, uh, a less, lesser intense version of conditioning. But um, we'll still maintain strength and, um, you know, accessory work during that time. Makes perfect sense. What have you, what have your clients noticed, uh, about like maybe, maybe some women that have had, had babies before training with you and then after training with you. So what have they noticed different in the actual birth, if anything? Yeah. Um, I would say the biggest thing is, um, recovery on the postpartum side. Um, and the, most women, let's say if they, like, like you said, they might've had a previous pregnancy or, um, you know, this is their second, third, fourth kid. Um, they're like, wow, this was like night and day different. And, um, you know, it really doesn't like whatever type of birth they had, whether it's a vaginal birth at home, hospital birth, cesarean birth, um, they, they will come out of that experience. You know, if they've employed all four pillars They've had that intentional practice throughout pregnancy. They've created the birth team that they wanted. You know, on the other side, they will have an empowered, um, and I say quotations, successful, um, because it's successful in their eyes, you know, a successful experience. Um, and that's what we want. Like, it, 
doesn't matter to me what I think is successful or not. All that matters is how that woman views that experience. Right. Um, yeah. So they, they, all in all, they have a more empowered experience and the recovery time is shorter. How soon after do you usually recommend people start training? And I assume it's kind of the same thing, right? Like the, the, um, when you're coming back, you're, you're working more on, uh, trunk stability, Mm -hmm. deep core muscles and stuff like that. But how soon do they start doing that kind of stuff and the breath work? Yeah. So I like to see my clients, like if I'm working with them in person, um, I like to see them for chiropractic care within the first two weeks of giving birth. So either they'll come into the office or I'll go to their house. And at that first visit, um, we do full body adjustments. We'll do soft tissue work. Um, and then we'll start working on that, um, deep diaphragm breathing, that belly breathing and creating that connection from the mind down down to the lower abdomen, to the lower sacrum, and bringing some awareness to that area again. Because no matter if it was a vaginal home birth with no drugs or um, you know, an emergency C-section, there's going to be disconnect from the brain to the lower belly, lower sacrum area. And you know, it may take women one week, it may take women um, you know, three weeks to establish that ideal breath pattern. Um, so we start working on that, you know, as soon as, you know, two weeks postpartum if we can. And and then, um, you know, from there, I like to at least have them breathing and bonding with baby, um, you know, at least through the first four weeks. And what I mean by bonding with baby is like, if they feel like going for a walk, put that baby in a carrier in front of you and go for a 20, 30 minute walk. Um, and you know, this is definitely at a like leisurely pace, but, um, you know, some women like to get out of the house, some women don't, and that's perfectly fine. But those first two to four weeks are designed to have like bond with baby and the immediate family. Um, and then after that, um, Let's say mom's been, you know, going for walks maybe every day for like 20 or 30 minutes. If there's no vaginal bleeding or no urinary issues, like um, urinary incontinence issues, then um, then we'll start on the functional progressions and we'll just start with the position of functional progression two or the position of functional progression one, and we'll make sure we can establish that breath pattern there and then we'll start to move through the functional progression one and two and um, we make sure we can breathe throughout each of those um, rudimentary or those function functional movement patterns Um, and this is really interesting I'll share this with you is that um, the functional progression is um, based on developmental kinesiology which is you know, a lot of us on our senior leadership team at BirthFit um, have done DNS training, which is dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. And even our core pelvic floor expert, Dr. Erica, has traveled to Prague and re- done, um, you know, extensive training with the Prague School of Rehab, where DNS is from. And um, they basically watched babies as they've learned to move. Um, from lying on their backs to starting to interact with their hands and feet to rolling over and then finding that like all fours tabletop position and then finding that bear position position and then crawling. Um, And so that's where the functional progression comes from Um, because babies are born with a separation in their abs and that separation is called diastasis rectus abdominis, DRA, which pregnant women, 90%, I would say, of pregnant women will have some sort of separation of their abs by the end of their pregnancy. Um, Some will just heal naturally and require no extra attention, but I would say at least half the women don't. And um, that's where the functional progression comes in is because any type of faulty movement pattern can be taken back to – developmental kinesiology where we can find a breakdown 
and you know we find where the breakdown is or um, where the movement pattern alters or where the breath stops and we work from there and it may take working from you know functional progression two for six weeks and you're hating functional progression two but you know it may take that long or it may take two weeks um and i noticed you have a ton of you have a ton of ebooks on your site that are free is any of this covered in that in any of those um actually there's a free webinar on i think it's our website still um and it's dr erica talking for about an hour um (laughs) which if you're into that kind of stuff i would say check it out um but if you're not into like core health and pelvic floor, it might be kind of boring and dry. But um, I'm sure it's super eye-opening for women. Um, and then there's also a psychology of eating um, free webinar on our on our website. Hell yeah! So what would they what would they Google birth fit or how would they get to that? Oh yeah, yeah. They can just go to the um, education tab on our website and. Um, at the bottom, um, it should say ebooks or webinars, or you can just go to our YouTube channel and you can type in birth fit pelvic floor and that'll come up. Um, if you have any trouble, you can always email me at info at birthfit.com. Awesome. So I got a couple more for you. Uh, yeah. what is something in the last one or two years that you've changed your mind on? <laughs> Oh, um, ooh, let's see. Um, I don't know if I've changed my mind on this, but, um, I used to think, um, that women could, so I've always thought the postpartum period, um, you know, lasts forever and, um, you know, it requires a special kind of attention, Um, but in the last two years, I've done some trainings and some work more in postpartum and, um, postpartum care and support. And, you know, as a, as a society, we do such a disservice to women in our country. And, um, you know, if we could, you know, if we have these communities, um, you know, gym communities or whatever, like these communities can come together and help support these new families or this um, mom that just gave birth because what we're finding out more and more and there's research on it is that the way a mom cares for her body, especially during the immediate postpartum, greatly influences her health as a woman later on in life. And this includes the menopause, um, like going through menopause and her health beyond that. Um, so I think just having such like an awareness and respect for the postpartum period is crucial. Um, it, it kills me whenever I see, um, women going back to their, you know, CrossFit classes or their training, um, you know, at like four weeks or six weeks postpartum and, you know, maybe they haven't done the proper, I call it recalibration, you know, with breath work or the functional progressions or they're just showing up and they're just modifying based on what their coaches say, you know? And to me, that's just kind of disrespectful towards that postpartum period. Mm-hmm. I love that. I did not know any <laughs> of that. Good to know. Yeah. What do you, th- okay, so I'm going to, I, this is one of my favorite questions to ask. Um, what do you want to make absurd in 20 years? And I'll preface it with, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it was totally common to see like a grocery, a grocery store clerk smoking a cigarette or someone throwing an entire trash bag, uh, trash bag (laughs) out of the window, right. And littering. Right. That's completely absurd. Uh, so with all of the work that your, you know, your whole life is focused on, what do you hope? Uh, to make absurd in 20 years? I mean, I'm going to say this and it's probably going to like, um, <laughs> cause extreme backlash. Please. I love it. <laughs> but I fucking hate strollers. Um, strollers are, they, 
and I, maybe it's not strollers. And I get like my mom had me and twins like all in less than two years. So you got to put the kids somewhere, especially if there's, you know, just you and mom, just you and the kids. Um, but these, I'd rather women wear their babies. Like we spent some time in France and Barcelona this past year, and I did not see strollers anywhere, you know, few and far between. Most of the time the women are wearing their babies. And this does so much for the development, not only um, for the spine of the baby, but for um, like baby learning how to breathe and interact with the world, socialization, cognitive skills. It's huge. Um, like strollers and those little bouncy things that you put the kiddos on, um, you know, and the bum bamboo chairs, like those things are just kind of absurd and they don't really, they're used more for convenience of the parent or the babysitter. And they're not really helping, um, the child's spine develop, the motor skills develop. Um, and they shouldn't be placed in a position until they can hold that position on their own. I totally understand. So is it <laughs> on the flip side, on the flip side, when, you know, kids are raised riding in strollers all the time, does it hinder their, their, their spine? Like, does it, does it, yeah. you say it doesn't help, but is it actually hindering their development? Yeah. Think about if you compare a kiddo, um, you know, strollers, the baby's basically in that C shape, C shaped position. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, if you have a mom that, you know, only wears a wrap or carries that baby right next to her chest and that baby's learning to move its head a little quicker because it's being stimulated by the outside environment, it's hearing and seeing mom interact with other human beings. It's hearing and feel or feeling mom breathe. It's feeling her like breath patterns. And so that kiddo is learning to extend their, their cervical spine and their upper thoracic and look around and maybe see what mom's doing. And then he's, he or she's going to start to mimic mom. And, um, that development is so crucial. And then like, just put your kiddo on the ground and let them crawl around on the rugs or build it, use building blocks rather than place them in a, you know, a thing, um, just to bounce around, you know, uh, at first I thought you were going to say, uh, do away with the strollers and start pulling your kids like a sled. <laughs> that, would your chain. <laughs> that would be amazing. That would be amazing. Well, all right, let's wrap it up, Lindsay. I really appreciate the time. Where, uh, where can people sure. find out more about you personally and look further oh. into what you're creating? Yeah. So you can find us at birthfit.com. Um, we're on Instagram as BirthFit, and all of our regional directors are like BirthFit NC for BirthFit North Carolina, BirthFit Wisconsin, BirthFit Colorado. I mean, there's a whole list of them, and you can go to our website and look at the regional directors tabs and find a regional director near you because there's nothing quite like the um, in-person experience. I love it. Um, yeah. I'm on Twitter as BirthFit, but I'm pretty shitty at Twitter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Instagram and Facebook, is, that's where you can find us. Um, also, check out our podcast. There's tons of free birth information there. Um, and then you can find my personal Instagram, Lindsay, because I'm the proudest member of the Fight in Texas Aggie class of 06. Oh, Whoop. God. <laughs> I knew you were going to love that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that you can find all, all that information at birthfit.com. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay. This has been wonderful. <laughs> you got it. Good Thanks for having me. Yeah. You too. Have I'll come see day. you soon. Perfect. All right. Bye. Bye.